right, so Ray here, and we are here at the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Houston. And I have the pleasure of sitting today with, many of you may know him if you've seen the movies in Colors, and you've been following him on YouTube, uh, if you've been out on the East Coast to any of the lectures, you will know exactly who this is. But for those who don't know, this is Professor James Small. He is a lecturer, a historian, an uh, African spiritualist, and we're going to hear from him today while uh, he's here in Houston uh, at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. He'll be speaking on tomorrow night, so y'all make sure y'all come out. But how you doing? How you doing, Dr. Small? I'm good, Sister Saray. Mm -hmm. I'm great. I'm glad to be back at the Shrine. I'm well, um, glad to have you. The Shrine is the first place I visited on my first trip out here. Hmm. So, and, and I'm sitting talking to the sister at the desk, and she goes, I remember you because I was here on your first trip here. Dr. Clark, Dr. Jeffrey, Dr. Wade Noble, Dr. Ace Henry, Dr. Robinson Jeffrey, and I think Dr. Spence. And we were staying in the house. The shrine had their own housing complex. And I thought that was the most unique and beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Black people would be the extraordinarily wonderful housing unit. For the kids to stay in, kitchen, living room, bedroom. These some real black folks out here in Houston. <laughs> That's a fantastic thing in the shrine. You know, we know of Jeremiah was supposed to my teacher Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. um, Malcolm always talked about him um, in their Detroit relationship, and so his conception of the shrine, the Black Madonna, and his building of the shrine, the Black Madonna, here in Atlanta and Detroit was a big plus, and it's still a big plus in the African-American community. And with this year actually being the 50th anniversary of the unveiling of that mural of the Black Madonna and Child, um, a lot of people in my generation don't know about that, but after doing the, the history on that, I, you know, back then it was on the cover of Ebony Magazine, like it was this huge deal, and uh, even Sister Elaine Brown, when she was here last week, remarked that we looked at the shrine as a part of the revolution, just, you right. know, just like we were, it wasn't right. like any other black church. Right. So can you speak to us a little bit um, just on the significance of why something as simple as switching up the visual of Jesus to represent what we look like and why that had such an impact in our community? Right, because well, we know people are taught that we are made in the image of God. But the truth is, all people made God in their image. And we were worshiping a God made in our enemy's image. Mm -hmm. So when the shrine produced a God that was in our image, it was an extraordinary thing what it did to the human mind. And it wasn't that they were faking something or creating some false ego thing for their group. The oldest painting of a Madonna and child is in Ethiopia, in the Church of Mary. It is a thousand years older than Michelangelo's first painting of the Madonna and child. And that painting in the Church of Mary in Ethiopia is of a black Madonna and child. I've seen it with my own eyes. And before that, on the 11th of every September, a holiday called Aritra is celebrated in Ethiopia as the Ethiopian New Year. That's a celebration of a Sar and, a, and, and Haru, I mean, I'm sorry, a Set and Haru and a Sar. So it has the mother, father, and child with the image of the first Madonna and child. They celebrate that as their New Year every year. So the black Madonna that was originated so back, far back in time, we don't even know was reintroduced to the psyche of the African American. And the impact was extraordinary. So Dr. Nobles teaches us is that you must learn how to remember in order to learn how to imagine. Because it's through imagination that you do creation. But if you don't have a memory of who you were and what you were, how can you recreate and get yourself to do what you want to be? So that was an extraordinary moment in time. And really, my only other question that I want to ask you is, a lot of people don't know um, about your link with the, 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 the holy, you know, um, Malcolm X, you know, El Hajj, El Hajj, El Hajj, A lot of people don't know. So can you um, 
talk to us a little bit about what that link is to really put it into context for some of the people mm -hmm. who may not really know how I do that goes. Right. I grew up in South Carolina on a plantation, a little town called Georgetown, between Murray Beach and Charleston, right on the Atlantic Ocean, in what was an old African fishing village. And if you go to Africa, brothers that go to Ghana, no, they go to the village. My village was just like that. We had the same kind of nets. We fished the same way. We had the same kind of needles to fix the nets. We did everything they did in Africa, but we didn't know that because we were in South Carolina. But when I was 15 years old, I saw Malcolm X on television. I was like, who in the world is that? So my mom and dad lived in New York. I asked them, could y'all bring me up there so I could meet this Malcolm X? <laughs> my mom was in the movement. So she brought me to New York, summer of 63. And a brother named Dwight Green, Whitey, took me around. We were on 115th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. The mosque was on 116th Street between 7th and Lenox Avenue. So Dwight took me around the corner to the, the, the temple, we called it back then. And the minister wasn't there. So the people said, oh, the minister is down on the 100 and, uh, what, that's the 141st Street and 8th Avenue in front of this store. And that would be the store where I worked packing groceries for the summer. Food, it's called Food Family Market. So I went on down there. I wanted to meet Malcolm X. But once I got in the presence of this tall, he was a very light-skinned brother. And he had a look. He didn't stare. I mean, like, he didn't move his eyes up or down or the sideways. He looked at you like he didn't look right through you, like a laser beam. Right? He greeted you, but he didn't take his eyes off of your eyes. Kind of thing. I was just trembling. I didn't know what to say once I met him. And I told him I was going to quit school. I was going to come up here and join him. <laughs> and he said, no, brother. He said, the way we're going to save our people is to educate our people. You can't quit school. Become an educator. Teach our people. You know, so that they can be free. And that was the only meeting we had and the only encounter we had. He spoke to me for maybe 15 minutes, but I don't remember anything else except him telling me to go back to school, go to college, and come back and teach our people because that was going to be our path to freedom. Mm -hmm. And I went back home. I got back to South Carolina. I thought I was Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And I joined the Naval Reserves to make some money, you know, to help out the family while I'm in high school, but I was doing all this habit, getting involved and picketing and takeovers and stuff. The white folks bamboozled me, so the day after, even though I had a scholarship to go to college, the day after they had falsely got me to sign documents I didn't know how to sign, the day after graduation, I was in the Navy. Didn't even know how I got there. Wow. You know? So while I was overseas, the next year, Malcolm was assassinated. And my big brother, who was in the organization, sent me to Clifton. I still didn't understand the full implications because he was supposed to be in France. So my brother sent the letter. So we were in Paris waiting for him, but he never came. So we went back to Nice and Cannes and partied and hung out. And then we would learn like a few weeks later he had been assassinated when he returned to America. And so my whole life from then on was to find out who killed him and killed them. I mean, very frankly, that was what was on, on my mind. So I came home some months later went to the organization. Most of the members of the organization had fled because of the warfare. And Malcolm's sister was not in charge. And there was hardly any of the men left. It was a handful of brothers. And so I joined in. And they needed men. So I was pulling brothers who was just coming back from Vietnam, young soldiers, trained in battle, but with black and mine. And I rebuilt the OAAU with his sister out. And I became an officer of the board of that organization. Then I realized the brothers needed a spiritual thing. So I asked them, could I reopen the Muslim mosque? So I was elected. I was the only elected imam in America. I was elected by a council of elders to be over the mosque. So by 1975, I'd been to Mecca twice. And it was the Hajj. I mean, the Hajj of being shaken. Um, I ended up closing the mosque because I realized at that point, Islam, as it was being practiced, was not our thing. I mean, the cultural manifestation of it was an Arab or foreign culture. And like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who didn't push that form of Islam, because he didn't want to take us from under the cultural dominance of white Christianity, he did not want to put us under the cultural dominance of white Arabs. And so I moved more deeper into the movement with the OAU, um, with the Black Panther Party, with the Black Liberation Army, my brother's like Zaid Shakur, 
established the Corps de la Mandesse, and they knew all young people together. Nobody knew anybody who was famous or assassinated. None of these things would happen yet. We were just out there fighting for our people. And so, if you know, Asada Shakur's husband was murdered on that turnpike that day. That was my closest combat. We had just been together a few days ago. He was on the run as one of the Panther 21. He was the only Panther 21 that never turned himself in. And his big brother, Lumumba Shakur, who was married to Athena Shakur, who was the mother of Tupac Shakur, uh, was the captain of the then Black Panther Party in Harlem. And he had sent a message to me to get to his brother and tell him that he was all right. And then we met at this laundromat up on St. Nicholas Avenue now on 45th Street. We were running clandestine meeting. Because all the police in New York were looking for Zayd. Because Zayd was a bad dude. And they caught him on the turnpike. And they really assassinated him and Asada fought in defense of her husband and her life. And that's how that shit happened. So I'm proud to say I know that. I'm proud to say I saw Sister Asada just before she had the baby after she was out of prison, before she went to Cuba, when she was incognito, but safe with the black community, protected her, kept her safe, until Fidel gave her the protection he did. So that's the kind of world I came out of, you know, as a youngster like you are. <laughs> we were just trying to help our people and do the best we can. Well, thank you so much for sharing that wisdom. I mean, I really, at this point, don't know what else I can say, you know, so I'm going to turn it over to you. But remember, your job is to teach the people for the rest of your life. No matter what else you do, teach the people for them to do. I'll show you today. I'll show you today. two-part question that I, I seriously got to know. <laughs> um, what role for women in our past culture, what role did they play that helped and continue to uh, build that economic strength? The, the question is a nice question, but it's almost asked in a Eurocentric context, okay. what role did women play? Okay. Women didn't have no role, and men didn't have no role. The family had a role. Mm -hmm. And the women and the men made up that family. So in that context, in the African culture, you know, nature has roles assigned for every element in nature. The feminine is an element in nature. And a big part of the feminine is nurturing anything. Nurturing the individual, nurturing the community, nurturing the family. So if you went in Africa, you would find the men in the early days worked in the field. The men went and did the hunting, but the people who built up the marketplace, the people who ended up inventing wholesale marketing and retail marketing was black women. You know, the men brought the produce, but the woman decided how that got marketed to one another for the betterment. So the men went and planted vegetables in the field and harvested, but the women created the market for the vegetables to be sold to other people. The men went and hunt, but the meat they brought back home, the woman took that meat and decided how it would be distributed in the marketplace. Today we see women behind sewing machines sewing, but in the old days it was men doing the sewing, the women did the marketing of what was sewing. So the women in our community, because that role of the nurturer, which is the nature, the naturalness, women can do anything men can do. And, and do, and throughout our history have. That's why in the early days, we had pharaohs like Hatshepsut. Not a queen of Egypt, but a pharaoh of Egypt. But Hatshepsut wasn't the first female pharaoh, nor was she the last female pharaoh. She was just one of the greatest ones that we know. So we didn't have a problem with the women ruling as far back as our culture goes. But at the same time, if you look at the history, and you look at Aset, the image of the woman is as the mother of humanity. And as the mother, she was the guiding element of your ethical, moral self. Meaning, the laws that got established in the community was carried out by the men, but was created by the women. Because she's the mother. She's the nurturer. 
she's the creating element. Men were the seeds of creation, but the woman is the elemental part of that creation. And so those things carries over into our social and cultural space. And that's what you go to Africa today and you go to any um, of the major marketplace, guess who's running it? It's the women. But if you go out to the farm, you will see the men. And if you want to buy some kente cloth, you go to the women. But if you want to go where they make the kente cloth, the people who run in those kente, um, what do you call those things that you do? Weaving machines, they're all men. The men weave the kente, but the women market the kente. And so that's when we really began to see the duality in unity. The balance. The balance and the harmony. My society. That's my heart. Sure. And, uh, one other question I do have is so far on black banking. Mm-hmm. What are, what does our black banking, our institutions, our black institutions in banking uh, play a role at this point? No, there's only black banking if you don't identify white banking. Okay. Or you just don't talk about banking. And where they're banking, you should always put race first. And we're afraid to say that. It must always be race first. So black people must own banks. Banks is a tool, you know. Chinese people got banks to take care of their financial business. European people got banks to take care of their financial business. Black people need to have banks to take care of their financial business. So banking is a tool to manage money, which comes as a result of your labor and your imagination in the world. And today, the banks that black people run that are established for the interest of managing black wealth need to be the place where black persons invest their capital. Because what a bank does is take your riches and turn it into wealth. You're talking about economics. Economics is not banking. Economics is not bookkeeping. Economics is not accounting. Economics is the wealth that comes from the earth. The gold, the diamond, and the manganese, the cocoa, the corn, the whatever. And so that natural resources, that's riches. But now you gotta have a system to turn the riches into wealth. That's where banking comes from. How do you take the, the riches that came from the ecology and turn it into wealth to be used and protect the community? And so the things we're calling black bank, or that banking tool that black people need to use for their best interests, comes into play. I wanted to say it that way, because when you say black banks, we have been so conditioned, we run away from ourselves. So let's look at banking simply as a tool, like a car. You know, you don't say a black car, but if black people know they got to own some cars. You know what I'm right. saying? I mean, we got to own some buildings. They're tools. Building is a tool that you use to house yourself. You know? So banking is a tool you use to take your riches and create your wealth. And so we must be controlled, be in control of the tool that we use to take our riches and to create our wealth. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Good day. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you, Bob, for coming down to Houston. Thank you for having me in front of the camera. A <laughs> uh, young technician. Yes, sir. Yes, who are changing the world. I mean, yes, this is technology. I'm, I'm Brother Atun Brown. I'm the host of Melanated and Eliminated Podcast. Yes. I'm also the PR representative for the Blacklist and okay. also for our other organization called Melanated Men of Action. Okay. And uh, with, with Melanated Men of Action, we're essentially uh, brothers boots on the ground out in the communities, whether it's community cleanups, whether it's mentoring young men, or just all around trying to be you know, an example to it. Yeah, like, being the fathers of your community. That's what you mean. You're being the brothers of your community. Because fathership and brothership, and notice I said fathership and brothership, not fatherhood, because the hood is when you got something hiding in your face, you don't want the world to see who you are. But a ship is something that's a vehicle that will carry you forward. So you deal with fathership and brothership. And that's what fathership and brothership do. It takes care of the community. That's your job. Well, um, Ray, I, I just have two simple questions for you. Yes. Uh, the, the first one, um, I, I know you're going to be giving a lecture tomorrow, so I don't want you to get, give too much away what you're giving tomorrow for the people to come out to the shrine. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, can you just speak a little bit about black economics under the new Trump administration 
and you know where we're kind of heading from here, and you know some practical solutions and goals or steps. Right. Remember, <clears throat> again, economics is controlling the wealth in your community and making sure the distribution of that wealth is for the benefit of you and your people. And whether Trump is there or Hillary is there, whoever is there, our responsibility to our community would be exactly the same. And that's the piece we got to be clear on. Now, there's a lot of hoopla about Mr. Trump and how bad he is and how evil he is, but none of that hoopla is being designed or coming from our community. It's coming from our enemy's community, and we follow in our enemy's agenda. We don't, Trump is nothing but a manager of the American political system. He's a manager that's being informed and instructed on what to do by those who backed and supported him then and now. Our job is to make sure whatever riches that can be garnered from this political administration is garnered by our leadership and turned into wealth for our community. One of the problems I see right now is the leadership we elected to go to Washington is saying, we're not dealing with Trump. We're not going to the meetings. But the Latino community that he said all the vile things about, their organizations is at the table. They are at the table to get for their community what's best for them. Okay? The Asian community, who's quiet and never really say nothing, their leadership is at that table. The Jewish leadership is at the table. The Irish leadership is at the table. Our leadership, who is being guided by the white community into all these demonstrations, is not at the table. I don't understand that. I don't even understand how our community, and then we'll come more directly to your question, jumped on Steve Harvey and Jim Brown in the negative ways that they did. Steve Harvey was in the black community helping black youth, but most of the people that jumped on him didn't even know how to spell black youth. Okay? Harvey had these ranches and these, um, what do you call this, um, these camps where he was taking these youngsters from the inner city and keep them from ending up in the penitentiary and guiding them to stay in high school and put them in college and raising the money to back them up. So we need to kind of be careful on what we are doing sometimes and saying. And Jimmy Brown, Jimmy Brown made his money in football. Jimmy Brown could have walked away. That boy didn't spend one day walking away from his community. He was out there with the bloods and the cribs, making them sit at the table, stop the shooting, stop the gang banging, come together, not just in California, across the nation. He was finding work for kids. He was tracking kids into college. So instead of going off on him, why don't we ask him, Jimmy, what is it that you want us to do? Why did you take that action? But we didn't do that. Because another people, the other white group who lost the election, who didn't have our interests no more at heart than this white group, is teaching, using us as they can and father to pro protest against the other group. I don't care about neither group. I only care about our group. Okay? Our job is to make sure we can provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for our black people. And that means we get to deal with whoever's in Washington, whether people like it or not, Donald, whatever, Trump, is the president of the United States for the next four years. Guess what? That's the only presidential game in town. Now, if you want to deal, that's who you got to deal with. So we need to not let the people who killed Mr. Gaddafi, who was trying to help Africa, we need to not let the people who brought the crack in our community. We need to not let the people who has used homosexual almost as a nuclear bomb against our community with the pedophilia and all of the other things, crime committed against our people. We need not to let the people who came up with a law that put more of our people in the penitentiary than was on the plantation of slavery tell us who to demonstrate against. That's all I'm saying. All right? yeah. So coming back to now, what do we do economically? We have to do what we should have done and must do no matter who's in the White House. We must learn to map the black community. Mapping means knowing who owned the stores and the business and the real estate in our community. And then we must learn to understand once we get the mapping and knowing who owned the real estate, who owned the stores, find out who of these people invest that capital in back in our community and who live in our community. And if they don't, stop shopping with them. We must find the black businesses in our community, which I think some of the organizations are doing, make a listing of those businesses and encourage our people to shop with them. Many times, 
black people just don't know that there are black organizations and black banks where they can put their money and black organizations where they can shop for the products they want in their community because we are so used to falling for that joke that we all the same. Right. No right, other community right. operates from that space. Right. Every community assumes I must meet the responsibility to my group first. And every community does that except us. Once we do that, we have to look and start understanding what does it take to establish businesses in our community. Teach people who want to go into business, set up something to teach them how to put together a business plan. Teach them how to find resources from the Small Business Administration to private investors within the community. Teach them how to market the business they do have. And we have many people in small businesses in our community operating out of their homes, operating as vendors on the street. How do we teach them how to market that product and get that product to the people? You understand? And how to bank their money and invest the money made with black banks or banks that would be called black in the black community, invest their money into black businesses so that they can get a return on their dollar and at the same time raise the black community. Wow. So wow. we have to do that no matter who's in power. Okay, okay. Man, I'm, all, all, this, all this energy, all this money got me all hot and sweating. Well, no, man, my last question for Professor Smalls, um, you know, we hear a lot um, of conversations surrounding religion and spirituality, mm -hmm. you know, you see the different camps, the Hebrews, the Kinetic yeah. Brothers, everybody, um, it's kind of like, seems like they're at odds right now. Yeah. Um, my, my question simply is, can black people gain spiritual freedom under Abrahamic religion? First of all, stop giving people something they're not. There is no such thing as an Abrahamic religion. See, that becomes a farce for people to use to keep from being responsible. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are nothing more than fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual system. And for those three especially, they break off of the African spiritual system in that formation that um, manifests itself as ancient Kemet. But even ancient Kemet isn't the genesis of African spirituality. That comes from further south in Congo and East Africa and West Africa into ancient Kemet and they amalgamate into this beautiful ecology to produce what we know as, as the Kemetic civilization. You don't see anything of Judaism until after these people who say they are the Jews spent time in ancient Kemet. You don't see anything of Christianity until after the same people spent time in the story of Jesus. He's 13 years old. Where did they send him? They send him to Egypt. Nobody sees him again until he's 32 and he got a religion. Right. Right? Right. You right. see Muhammad. Nobody knows nothing about Muhammad. He has a wife named Khadijah who runs a company. She had one of the biggest companies, a very wealthy woman. She ran a caravan. A caravan is like having a fleet of tractor trailer trucks today. Right. And so where does he have to go? The biggest place in the world is now Kemet. Right. So he's running the caravan in and out of Kemet. And then he comes up with this whole concept of how to liberate himself from the Greek and the Roman children. And the concept is called Islam. He doesn't learn this Islam until after he sojourned in Kemet and learned the culture, the spiritual culture of African people. I was a Muslim for many years. I went to Mecca. I went to, to the Kaaba. Well, if you study ancient Kemetic literature, you'll see that the Ka is the spirit and the Ba is the soul and then the Ka and the Ba comes together. It creates a house called the house of God. You know what the Kaaba in Mecca is called? The house of God is called Beitul Allah. So somebody take your concept and reconstruct it in their culture and present it to you anew. So if you understand your history and your spiritual system, you know that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam don't come from nobody named Abraham. It comes from our ancestors and just fragments from the periphery of our system. But because they were able to use their war machine, they have parlayed it into international religion based on committing genocide, especially against the African peoples and most of the rest of the world. Now that's the truth that will set you free. You know, it makes some other people upset. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for sitting down with me, brother. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you for coming out here. Thank you for sitting with me. And it was an honor. Sure. Did that make sense? I mean, did y'all get that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 so the last, this is the last question. I asked you to ask this off, off camera because I want you to look directly into the camera for this one. Okay.
Man, I, bro, that's a good. That's a good question, bro. Yeah. Bobby, hey, you can't throw clothes. Keep Bobby, that was a good, uh, yeah, good job. My son, man. come in here. Let me swap our cards. Swap our cards. You need any water? You got, you got anything? Yeah, you want to take a break for a second? Or? This question might give you some thought. It may make you want to go a little bit deeper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you letting me, you know, telling me about myself. You know, I'm thinking that's my from, job. Uh, you just corrected me on something I need to know about. That's, that's yeah. the, the, the key thing to knowledge is nobody has got it. I got fragments. You got fragments. But if we get together out of respect and we gossip one another to share the fragments, we'll have a bigger picture of what the knowledge body looks like. What's wrong with the brothers and the sisters who are using those different religions? I didn't want to hit them too hard because those are white interpretations of aspects of our philosophy. And what they're doing is what white people do, argue with each other about something that they don't know nothing about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I didn't want to put that out there because that yeah, would sound, yeah, you know, yeah, abusive. Yeah, yeah. I we wanted could, to put something out there. It would be a learning, a learning piece. Um, but if they would sit in the room, those who are Jews, those who are or Hebrews, those who are Muslim, those who are Christian, the Sikh, they're all worshiping the same thing. They even got the same book. If you read the Quran, the Old Testament is in there, the New Testament is in there, and the last revelation of Prophet Muhammad. That's what makes up the book. So it ain't nothing different. So you got the Jews and then the Christian and then the Muslim. They're all the same thing. And the same thing when you're looking at Christianity. You got all the Hebrew stuff in there, and you got the new Christian stuff that Paul throws up in there. Then you go to the Hebrew thing. The Hebrew thing is about a bunch of marauding mercenary soldiers who were Africans. But just as we see happen today, when the hike sauce invaded and took over our land, because I don't want to put this on camera, I don't want y'all to be considered ones that's injuring other people's heart. You can do that later. But just to show to y'all ears the history, when the Africans in the 20th, was it the, in the 18th dynasty, stopped moving to drive the hick sauce out, there was a lot of us who had lived under them and had betrayed our people for 400 years who got kicked out too. That's the Hebrews. Mm. Mm. See, that's, that's the untold so story. That's why, mm. that's, why that's, why so that's why they're so rejecting of Kemet. Right. You got your being from Kemet and you rejecting your mama? What's wrong with you? Mm. Because mm. You, you left <laughs> Kemet like a thief yeah. in the night. If you study in the book of Genesis, you'll see that they're using all of the military um, skills of the Egyptian army and for that whole book of Genesis, in Exodus, they're murdering and pillaging and plundering and raping other black people's villages and towns. The whole thing about Joshua, Joshua March on Jericho. Well, Jericho was a black town, and you went and genocided them. And then you worshiping it. It got me worshiping it. And before they even get to Jericho, right in their own literature, they tell you how they're killing the people, taking the town, raping the women, and if the woman that has sex with a man before they met him, just murder him straight out. This is the Bible. So you want to be proud of that? You be that. You know what I'm saying? But see, the problem is a lot of us who criticize them don't read the literature for ourselves. Read the thing. And you see, oh my God, this is who you want to be? Go on and do that. Because I don't have nothing no, to do with that. You understand? And that's why you got to read this literature. When Muhammad comes, he said, I didn't come to bring a new religion. He said, I come to restore that which was here in the beginning. So he came to bring the thing back to African culture. But right after Muhammad dies, there's a coup d'etat by the white folks, because Muhammad is black. All the dudes around him in his primary circle, men and women, are black. After he dies, he leaves the old man of Abu Bakr in charge. He dies just from old age. Then Umar takes over, and he's assassinated, right, by a dude named um, Uthman, right, who is the nephew of the cat, Abu Sufyan, who was trying to murder Muhammad years earlier. Mm -hmm. So it's a coup d'etat. Then when Ali, Muhammad's blood cousin, step in and kill this dude, he gets attacked by the, the, the general up in Syria named Muawiyah, 
was the cousin to the dude he just met. And this is where the Iranians come in. family, which is the black leadership. So the white folks, the light-skinned folks, who takes over Persia, because the true Persian is also black, but these people we see in Iran now, these are the Kurds who take it over. They kind of deal with the black folks, Muhammad's family, so we'll give you, we'll give you a sanctuary, but you're going to have to turn over the priest ship to us. That's where the movement's coming to be, and that's how Shia religion is born. And that's how the war that we've seen in the Middle East between the Shia and the Sunnis began and is still going on to this day. The Sunnis came to be the God, the, the ones carrying the scepter of the Prophet, but that's not true. They're the ones that murdered off the family of the Prophet. The Shia offered sanctuary and protection to the Prophet's family, but they didn't do it for the sake of carrying the tradition forward. They did it for the sake of getting the secret information, the mystery system data to build their power nexus in the world. Because this is all about the lodge. This is all about the crack. <laughs> Some of this we can't yeah, say yeah. on. Yeah. Oh. That's my lodge. So okay. <laughs> well, so, yeah, yeah, we from uh, from uh, whence do y'all have? Uh, April Lodge number 16. Right? Okay. I'm Cornerstone Lodge number 37. Hmm. New York State Grand Lodge. Huh. Up and home. I'm good to visit you, Okay. okay. United Most Worshipful Scottish Rite Grand Lodge here in the East, 1102 okay. Andrew. That's our, our grandmother. Alright. Y'all look like y'all are. 10 years this year, actually. Yeah, 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 that's my cable oh. talk right there. Yeah. Oh, very okay. good. So, I'm, I'm about in my, my 45th. But, but that's oh, yeah. good. That's true. But I never went. Has three because you don't need no more than three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. We just in three. We can, we just there, there, there was only three. <laughs> Actually, there was only two. Mm. Okay, but we could work to three because three is an extension of two. Mm. Everything else is ceremonial and should what it should be up between three and thirty-two. It should simply be the lessons to help enhance your knowledge of three. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I said this year I'm finally ready to go ahead and get those other ones. So yeah, I had no price, I had no desire to get them. No, so. do it knowing it is an extension of the body of knowledge. Because once you reach three, remember, you reach three, you went to ceremony, but you don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing between three and 32 is learning all that you need to know is three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I can give you the whole body of knowledge in a few sentences. You know what the whole body of knowledge is? Do unto others as you have them do unto you, but never do it because you want them to do unto you. That's the whole amazing thing, right? Mm. Makes sense. Run right with that. <laughs> you right God be that. God. Yeah. I told him. <laughs> when you met me. Yeah, come on, quit playing. <laughs> playing around. This one right here, be playing with. Yeah. No, but they're going in because it's a, it's a vehicle. It is one of the most powerful vehicle in the world. Whoever's behind the wheel, is going to get the the proofs of using the vehicle. If you're going to leave it in the hands of the white boy, you can't complain that he's using it to do what he's doing. You understand? So if you want to ride on the, the most fantastic vehicle in the world, you got to get on board and take control of that steering wheel. You can't sit back and talk about somebody else is driving the vehicle when you have an opportunity to get in the vehicle and take control of the driver. Because it all comes from you. Matter of fact, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all fragments of Freemasonry. Right. Okay. Well, I don't like the term Freemasonry because it don't come into being as Freemasonry until the British get a hold of it, but it's the craft. And it's in every African country. Voodoo is the craft. You understand? Yoruba is the craft. You understand? But if you don't know what the craft is, you won't understand that voodoo and root right here in America is the crack, the retentions that we brought with us. Because we let them bamboozle us because they put all these big edifices to their so-called temples and churches and stuff. We think that's something significant. But that's nothing but symbols that they can't even interpret for themselves. Hmm. You know? so you gotta know it's the crack. 
in the, the simplest term that we get back to you already is that we are God having the human experience. Right? If you get that, the rest is just to learn how you are God having this experience. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about tomorrow, so I ain't gonna give you a yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have I have one question, Bob. Could you speak to the importance of understand the, the brothers and sisters in the North American diaspora understanding the importance of uh, or the significance of our cultural timeline and why it's important for us to build bridges with our brothers and sisters across the water, but more specifically West Africa? No, you just messed up when you said more specifically West Africa. Most of us didn't even come from West Africa. It appears that we come from West Africa. But all the persons you've seen from Africa, West Africa is shorter than you. They got rounder face than you. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't even look like most people in West Africa. So all of us have some of the genes of West Africa. Most of us came from Kenya. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever explained that to anybody, because that would be too big a. Study the history of Islam as it invades Kenya. 10th, 9th century, well, 1st, 8th century, the Arabs come in and take over Kenya because we joined with the Arabs in order to oust the Romans when they're sitting on our head century. Then the Turks come in the, if a, that was the late part of the 6th century, go to the 8th century, Turks come and take the system away from the Arabs, Turks and the Kurds. And so black folks coming from North Africa, the people who we erroneously call Moors, the Moors is just an a Roman word for black. So we speak English to say black. Don't try to create confusion by saying there's a special group of black folks called Moors. <laughs> They're the same black folks. They're the same black folks. You know, just like we could say Negro. People say that's a bad. No, it's not a bad word. That's the Spanish word for black. They're the same black folks. Okay. And so they come in under um, the the ninth century. And they take Egypt back. They take Kemet back from the Turks. But at the tenth century, the Turks take Kemet back. But because if you study their history and you get into their Arabic, you'll see that we were rebelling, rebelling so much, they said, we got to do something about these Negroes. So that's the first case in history of ethnic cleansing where millions of people are pushed out of a civilizing area. But they need people. They came into Kenya because they wanted the farmland to plant barley and wheat to feed their armies that's conquering the world and plant um, olive and all the other things they're getting for that day and to get the gold and stuff. But we won't plan and mind for them, we fighting them. So they throw us out, drive us into the Sudan and into Ethiopia. And most of us turn to an area called Darfur. Darfur is famous for a reason and not what's going on today. So we push through Darfur into West Africa. When we get to West Africa, those folks are already established. So they go like, yo, Y'all can't come up here and take our shit. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we're like a very organized grouping. So a war starts between us and even the brothers from West Africa, the people on top of them. And so many of us come because we have been under this Muslim dominance and we're Muslim. But we're not Arabs. Most of us aren't Muslim. So by this time, the white folks have attacked from the West. And so the West African people are caught in the catch-22. They get conquered pretty much right away on the coast. White folks, when they need enslaved people, they tell these folks here, we come to your village, brother, and we'll be back at the end of the month. We want 50 women, 100 men, and under this age. Now, if you ain't got it, we got the guns, and we got the horses, we're going to take you. What you gonna do? You go to the refugee community of the people from Kemet who camped all up in your area, ain't got no protection for themselves and no connection to the land, and you capture them as your prisoners of war. And to save the greater community, you sell these people to the enemy. And in many cases, the enemy came in on their own and just raided our camps and took us. That's why you see all these paintings of them marching people across Africa and all this stuff around their neck. If you capture in the West Africa on the coast, then you don't need to be doing all this, all this, all this marching about who are those people. And what happened to the millions of people of Kemet that was pushed out of the Nile Valley by the Turks and replaced 
by the Serbic people of Eastern Europe. That's where the word, the Slavic people rather, that's where the word slave comes from. You understand? They brought us, brought them in from Europe to work the land. These are the people you now call Arabs. They just mixed breed Europeans who was mixed with Attila the Huns people and some of the other people. That's the people Trump is married into. That's why y'all got to check Trump all right. Trump ain't playing the white race card you think he's playing. That's why he ain't got no problem with the boy who had Russia, because he ain't no white man. They know they're not really white. They're mixed with Attila the Hunt, and, and, and it was the Khan name? The Aga Khan. Not Aga Khan, what's the other Khan name? The one that with the invading armies. You know, the, those folks. That's who they mix with. All of Trump's white come from among those people. What's that about? Isn't Trump German? Like, yeah, he's got some German connections, but where does the German genesis start? In the Caucasus Mountains. The Ostrogoths and the Vistagoths. Mm. That's why studying mm. history becomes relevant and important. And watch the movement down into what is Germany. We're confusing, there's, a, there's two different kinds of Germans. We're confusing the Vikings who ends up being called the Anglo-Saxons with the Ostrogoths and the Vistagoths who come these crackers born out of the Caucasus Mountains. So that's why studying history becomes very important. Then you see what the war is between them. What you've got now is a war between the Germans and the Jews. We said, well, Trump's son is married to a Jew. Where white folks are concerned, Judaism is not genetic, it's religious. That's it. The German is genetic. Yeah, she may have married yeah. a Jew, but that Jew may be genetically German. Thank you. you understand what I'm saying? So they playing you if you don't know what's up. Taking their own race. You know, so that's enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. Let me let me uh, come yeah. on. I'm just gonna stop and start. Okay. okay. I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, we need to get that. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. uh, you ready, man? I'm ready whenever you're ready. Okay. Three, two, y'all good? Yeah, good. Three, two, three. Peace and blessings, family. We're sitting here with the prolific elder, Professor James Small. And uh, this is Hotel Mag doing the interview with Professor James Small. I got one question for you that we always ask at Hotel Mag. What yes. woke you up? What philosophy, what ideology, or what thought process changed your mind and brought you into the conscious arena? See, the assumption is that my mind has changed. I'm a root woman's child. Mm. I grew up in South Carolina. I come from a nation called the Gullah Geechee Nation, or the Geechee Gullah Nation, depending on what you want to say. We exist as a nation. You know us in the world as the Seminoles, but we're not the Seminoles. All the Seminole is is the Spanish word for runaway. Okay. And so, from the word Cimarron. So, I'm a member of the Gullah Geechee Nation. My grandmother, Miss Pigeon, was a root woman. That means an African priest and a herbalist. You know, her father, my great grandfather, came to this country. He was a Tusi man. He came from the area we know today as Uganda, Rwanda. He came as a child, him and his brother and his mom. So I come out of that culture in the woods of South Carolina. I'm from what you call a, a maroon community. They used to use, and I'm going to put this word on there, people be upset, because I'm not caught up on the end word fact that the people caught up in. We were called the Freewood Niggas. Freewood Niggas, meaning the communities that we built, the runaway enslaved African built communities all through South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and they were called the Freewood Niggas. The Seminole Nation was the largest group of Freewood Niggas in North America. And that's why when Andrew Jackson went to fight him, he says, I'm going, he told President Pope, you send me down there to fight Indians and all, I'm fighting his niggas. Okay? Because they know who we were. We're the Gullah Geechee Nation. And those should not be called similar wars. They should be called the Gullah Geechee Wars. And we never lost one of those wars. We never lost one of those wars. We defeated Jackson outright in the first war and humiliated him and all of his army that he had brought back from New Orleans that had just defeated the British. That's why they don't want to talk about it. So I come out of that culture, so I don't know another way. All of my life, my way was about the struggle and the people I come from. Even the villages that I come out of, 
One is Plantation in the Woods, it's called Arcadia. And the other villages we have, one is called Simmonsville. It's all my family, all black people. We've been there since the 1800s. The other is called Marysville, all black people, about a half mile down the road. I was up in whole towns, this is us. <laughs> up the road is Parkersville, all black down. Up the road from that is Fraziersville, all black down. Up the road from that is um, Burgess. That's where a lot of my family come. That was real deep woods. We just started modernizing that in the last 20 years. Um, all black people. Now you got a bunch of white folks that come up and they're developing and buying lands. Mm -hmm. Then you got the islands, like freshwater islands, like Sandy Island, that's still all black, all us. I come out of that culture. I never saw a white teacher until I got to college in New York in my 20s. So that's the world I came out of. We were at war every day of my life. We was fighting white folks all of our life. I was 18 years old. I'd hurt my ankle in football the week before I played football at Howard High in Georgetown. So mama, my grandmother, wouldn't come and see me play football, but she'd always give my brother and sister 50 cents to go to the game to see how I was doing. But she said, I'm not coming out there and watch these people beat up on my child. So, she, <laughs> so this night, after the next game, after the injury, Instead of doing, we lived in the country, so we had to cross two rivers to get home. So we had to hitch a ride, and most times with white folks, sometimes with black folks. And um, so I said, let me go home early so mama could see I'm all right. Because when I left home, I left home limping that day. That night, there was an incident. I left, I didn't roll with my usual crew, other brothers who lived across on the island where I lived. So I went by myself, and there was two young black people at the bridge trying to get a ride. And they came over to me and they said, um, um, James, these white boys call us Blackie when we came out the movie theater. They were a little bit younger than me. So they were scared. So I said, we all come to me. But I come from this family of warriors. So I pulled my hunting knife out. That was that long. I gave that to one. I reached my back pocket and my handkerchief. I pulled out my straight razor and I gave that to the other one. <laughs> and I kept the two shot derringer. That's the way I moved as a 17 year old kid in <laughs> high school, 18 year old kid in high school. <laughs> in South Carolina. What happened this night, I took the two young people and asked them to go in the other corner. And I asked them, if you get a ride first, tell them I'm on this corner. And if I get a ride, I tell them you're on this corner. Meanwhile, there's about 200 white boys gathering at this drive-in, milling around, drinking liquor like they do every Friday night. The car came by that cussed them out at the theater and yelled again, hey, my dog Blackie. They said this now to me and they swung a lead pipe at me. So I caught the, the lead pipe before it hit me, and the car moving, the pipe slipped out of the white boy's hand. So I threw it back at the car, not meaning to hit it, but to show a gesture of defiance. He hit the brake, and the thing went through the back windshield. I was like, oh shit, I'm in trouble now. Because there's 200 of them across the street. Then the car takes off and go around the corner, comes back to the drive-in. Now, the Rala. I'm noticing this incident now. The two young boys who I stopped to help gets a car, get a ride, and leave me out there by myself. With 200 white boys between me and the black community in the city. So, I start walking towards the bridge because I knew the white man that owned the house that operates raising the bridge. But something in my brain told me, don't go there because he's a white man. Then the crew, the 200, starts chasing me. I'm running on this road, bro. Remember, one of them hit me inside my head with a shovel. I just swung the shovel at the car window, slammed me, but I didn't go down. I kept on running. Then I was being hit with bottles and stuff as the different cars passed by me. And I got to a road in the marsh. They were building this new bridge, and so they pumped all the sand. I knew they couldn't get in the marsh, so I ran into the marsh. And I went as far as I could. Now, I wasn't so mad they were chasing me that night. Mama had just bought me a brand new corduroy coat. Mm -hmm. Brother, you know how you want that corduroy coat with the sheep's lining and that knitted collar with the leather buttons? Man, them ladies are looking at brother in school. <laughs> now I'm in the marsh with mud all over my coat. <laughs> right? So I go as far as I can go. You can hear them out there, hey, nigga, 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 this. And then they start shooting, bow, through the marsh. And I, after that third shot, I only had two shots in my derringer, which was my 16th birthday present from my grandma, by the way. So I fired one shot back up in the air. Bam! That silenced their guns, because they didn't know what I had. They didn't know who I was. 
But they stayed out there all night, occasionally find a shot and talking and throwing stuff. But I was so far away, they couldn't hit me with anything. My coat now was covered in mud and it was so heavy I had to take it off. And it was cold, this is October, and leave it in the mud. That morning, I'm telling you the story for a reason. That morning, I realized, and I played football. I actually ran the 100 in those days, I don't know, 9, 4 or something. Only person faster than me in America was Bob Hayes, who went to school out here someplace after he left Florida and Florida and now. And so, they still drinking beer and getting drunk all night. Some of them left, but close to about a hundred of them were still there. The morning came. And when I thought I had the curse, because my uncle lived two blocks, three blocks away. The coach lived two blocks away. But they were between me and them, right? So when morning came, by about, I guess, six o'clock, I said, maybe I could make it. I left the coat in the mud, because it was of no use to me. And I took off running. I crossed the street called St. James and the Crackers saw me. And they said, they go, the nigga. And they starts running. And I was heading for the coach house, my coach's house. But when I hit the coach's yard, I was going too fast. I couldn't stop. I just went zoom right to the coach's front yard, backyard. Found myself in a place called Levy Alley where my uncle lived. And I hit open the gates and ran up. I knocked the door right off the hinge and fell on the floor in the living room. My uncle and them were bootleggers. So they are playing cards and gambling. They got their rifles and stuff. When I hit the floor, the white boys came up on the porch. They chased me right up in my uncle's house. Uncle and them spun around with shotguns and rifles and the crackers looks my nose and turned them start running and they chased them down the road. Now, I laid that out because we didn't live in an environment of friendship with most whites. We lived in a war zone. By the time I could know that I was in existence. We were instructed how to handle us. The reason I had that two-shot derringer, because that was my 16th birthday gift given just for such an occasion. And the reason I had the hunting knife to give the boy and the straight razor to give the boy, because that's the way we moved. Because we knew we were walking through enemy territory at any given time, any given day. So when I saw Malcolm X in 1962 on television, I recognized somebody that I admired extraordinarily because I was Andrew Small's grandson. I'm Robert Small, great-great-nephew. So I come out of a whole culture of resistance down here. If you know anything about the Gullah Geechee people, the first major war of resistance was the Cato Rebellion in 1720-something in South Carolina, just by Walterboro and Charleston, South Carolina, about 40 miles from where I was born, when we defeated the British and then we marched a whole continuum of our people into Florida, the people who would become the so-called Seminole Nation, which is the Geechee Gala Nation that built Fort Moses, which Andrew Jackson was going to Florida to destroy with four different war assaults on us and got defeated in all four assaults. So that's what I come out of. So I don't know a time when I was what you call unconscious. You know, my whole life has just been this. It's been the most beautiful journey anybody could want. It's just being free. You know, it's just being free. I remember when I was 18 and uh, and there was a sister I liked. I could call her name because I ain't never did her wrong. And she, her name is <laughs> Sister Bessie Gore. She is a Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That sure enough was a pretty girl. And I was going to my bestie's house, this is 1960-something. And I mean, the brother and sister, there like, come James and that black, you know, James, all you always talking that black stuff. So I go like, okay, I'm not going to betray the black stuff, I'm just going to take the old woman. You know what I'm saying? Because the women love the black stuff. It was the brothers that, thought, you know, didn't get it, you know. And so we were always fighting, I mean, um, from Malcolm's organization, to the Black Panther Party, to the Black Liberation Army, it just seemed so normal. Nobody knew anything about being famous or being on the front page, being on the newspaper. We were just young black people saying, we ain't taking no stuff. Even in the town I grew up in, you can lift this town up, it's called Georgetown, South Carolina. I grew up in the country outside of the town. The white kids was let out of school 45 minutes before us. You know why? So they can get their asses off the street. Because if they were there when we get rolled up down them streets, they're going to be some behind whipping going on. So they got 45 minutes head start to get home. And then we were let out of high school. So just to, in answer to your question was that 
I grew up in this culture of resistance, with these culture of these maroon people. I'm also what the people are calling the, um, you know, part of the nation that they call the Native American. Um, the black people who were here before the Asiatic Nation Americans arrived. I'm from a nation called the Chikora Nation. We still exist. They wouldn't classify us because we're so black as Native American until 1972. Um, our headquarters is in Andrews, South Carolina. A lot of our tribal people are on the reservation in North Carolina being classified as Cherokee. And we are not Cherokees, we are Chikoras. But that's the, the nation that Brother Imhotep and others are writing about. We do exist. We were here before the, the white-skinned Native American Asiatics, and we were definitely here before Columbus and them. But I'm also Africans from the continent. Some people came on the enslavement process, and I'm from the, one of the greater runaway communities down there. So that's who I am. That's what I am. Those are the people I came out of. Those are the people who sent me forward into the world to represent them. And I've always been proud to do that representation. Anybody you can meet that know me know this is the same James Small I was in high school. You know, that you're now seeing. And w w last but not least, uh, we also have a question with... Oh, okay. Okay. You, you say you still have another one too? Yeah. Oh, well, you got them, no, 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 yeah, no. you're going to go in there and then. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Go. Okay. Okay. And Professor James Small, uh, one last question. We also want to know, what would you like to uh, tell the young people as far as we talk about liberating ourselves? Mm -hmm. To the young people, what, would you, what kind of advice would you give them so we can do a better job of raising up our people in the community? They must humble themselves to the teaching of the older people who want to give them wisdom and guidance. You must humble yourself to the teaching in order to learn your history. History is the best medicine for a sick mind. If you learn your history, you will restore your psychic and spiritual memory. And when you restore your psychic and spiritual memory, which history does for you, you will begin to elevate your ability to imagine all of the possibilities that you and your mind can become. But you must first start with the respect and the humility to listen to the teachings of your elders. That's the key. Okay. You were going? Yeah, yeah, just fine. Okay. That's, is, like, is it real brief? Like, should I go sit on the thing or just... I have to go on the door, though. Because I'm going to edit it in anyway. You're going to edit it in. You can sit down. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Do you have a time? Do we have time to take like the pictures? Pictures. We got picture time? Yeah, because we got like. No, I'm cool. I'm rolling with y'all. We on your time. No, I'm rolling with y'all. Because if I don't roll with y'all and don't work out well, I don't know somebody going to be called to my house. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to right, do it. Right, right. Hey, and she called me and said, y'all want to do this. And it's her love and her heart oh, that we said, I, mm, I mm, want mm. her to be happy when this is yes. done. I would have done my best. Is that cool? Thank you. Thank you. You've been hard on me, but you just <laughs> you're not here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am here <laughs> and doing what I promised. Thank you. Thank you. Studying lately about the Haitian Revolution, 
And one thing that I'm picking up on is how voodoo was the engine behind it. I want to gain an understanding, an overstanding, uh, from your perspective of how voodoo was the, how voodoo pretty much secured the win. Okay. Let's talk about first what is voodoo? Because people got all these false assumptions about some spooky religion where people got powers that are extraordinary and all of that. Voodoo, the word voodoo itself appears in two languages, the Pan language, that's the people of Benin, uh, West Africa, and the Eri language, another people of West Africa who lives in Togo and the Volta region of Ghana. And the word literally means the essence of the divine in the human or the essence of the divine in nature. So if you want to say the essence of God, the essence of the divine in the human, you say voodoo Godsey. If you want to say the essence of the divine in man, you say voodoo Daha. Or the reverse, voodoo Daha is the essence of the divine in nature, and voodoo Gazi is the essence of the divine in man. Now, that we understand that the word simply is a form of God. It means in our language what the word Lord means in the English language relative to God. God in the English language is the highest level of referring to the omnipotent. But to describe the omnipotent as a functionality, he is described as Lord. That's what the word Fugu means. And so the system of African culture that we now call Brutal, what won the Haitian Revolution was a return to African culture. People are calling that culture Voodoo, but then misnormally describing it as a religion. There is no such thing as a Voodoo religion. There's an African cultural way of knowing reality and knowing your place in reality. Voodoo is a word that has been that is our one of our words for the divinity that is used to describe our whole cultural system. So what happened in Haiti was there were practitioners of that cultural system that guided the efforts of resistance and rebellion against the oppression of enslavement. And some of them were actually Muslims. If you know, we always talk about Bookman who said the poem and started the revolution, but that's not historically true. That's folklorically true. The person who initiates that meeting in the Alligator Swamp is a woman, a mambo. Mambo simply means a, a priest, a female priest. You know, her name was uh, Fatima, Cecile Fatima. And Cecile Fatima and other priestess is the ones who organized this day that black woman with other brothers, but these black women under Cecile Fatima was the key. And Bookman was one of the brothers who they thrust into the leadership. And Bookman was the brother who was resisting the British in what is now Jamaica. The British didn't want to kill him there and make a martyr out of him, so they sold him to the French. The French were so vicious, they feared the French could break the dude. But instead, the dude becomes the leader of the earliest part of the revolution. Remember, before Bookman gets there, there's another brother leading the Haitian resistance. His name is called Mackendow. And what he's doing, he's an African herbalist who's teaching people to learn the fauna, the plants, and the herbs in Haiti and use it to poison the white families they work for. This is before Bookman. This kind of resistance is going on. So what becomes the Haitian Revolution is a continuation of a resistance that began when we first came here. And it is informed and instructed by men like Dessaline and Toussaint and sisters like Defile and Cecile Fatima, who are the keepers of the ancient culture. And they began to teach this culture and the principles of the culture to others who had either forgotten it or didn't know it. And it is the bonding of the African culture that formulates what uh, Dessaline would call liberty or death, freedom or death. Either we will live as free beings or we will die or kill trying to be that. The Haitian Revolution 
is not finished. It won major victories. It destroyed the mightiest military the whites had arrayed to that day, the army of Napoleon Bonaparte. It defeated the British and the Spanish in that fight and thwarted even the American effort to intercede. So it's an extraordinary military and psychological victory for a small group of black people on one island to defeat the mighty white empires of the day with no real military weapons except what they took from the enemy. And the reason they were able to do that is their culture and their spiritual understanding of reality gave them the courage to face the adversity, knowing they would win. That's the key to understand but any encounter against any enemy. But because the revolution was betrayed by the likes of Boyer and, and, and um, Pétion and the assassination of Dessalines, even uh, Christophe was involved. And so with the death of Dessalines, who is the irritated genie, who is the mastermind, he came up with the concept, Coupetet Bouleka. He said, if y'all gonna leave our land, because you were so vicious and you were so cruel and so destructive, we've given you the chance to get on the boat and go back to France. You don't go, Coupetet, we're gonna cut off your head and Bouleka, we're gonna burn your dwellings to the ground. And he did it. And the weak-minded ones among them. Because before the, the Dessalines takes over the movement, even while Tucson is, is fighting in the early phase of this military resistance, Boyer and Pétion were part of the mulatto movement, which was totally separate from the movement that Tucson and them would lead. They would coalesce with the mulattoes. The mulattoes were fighting to be included, since they were the children of the enslavers. They were not fighting to free the Africans from slavery. They were fighting to have the mulattoes be given greater rights in the society. But they weren't, since they couldn't have any achievements, when the black folks on the real side started fighting to destroy the system altogether, some of these mulattoes who had betrayed the movement and ran away to France, like Boyer and Petion, who said, we're coming back to help you all fight to destroy the whole thing, were brought back in. And these same mulattoes turned out to be the ones who would betray the very revolution. They came back to join. So there's a lot of lessons to learn from this. It's not you know, a lot of lessons. So the revolution is not complete. Mm -hmm. The role of voodoo in that is the, the degree to which the role of the African culture and its value itself is used as the guiding ideology for organizing the people's resistance. Peace, that's peace. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just uh, one more drop, just uh, on the account of uh, the Lodge in Ghana, the Sound of Lodge in Ghana. Mm -hmm. how, can, uh, how can people contribute to that? Like, can you explain that? Uh, Right. Going right. We have a hotel in Ghana. It's called Sana Lodge. The word Sana means the place of wealth. Its esoteric meaning means the place from which one does not depart until the task is complete. And so we acquired this 30 room hotel. Um, it's a complex. We have a massive um, conference center. Um, we have a full-size swimming pool, we have cocktail lounge, we have a pool, side bar, we have our own parking lot. It is an extraordinary place, an extraordinary phenomenon. It's owned by African Americans. It's 80 of us who are Pan-African. This is just put our little digits together. I've been the CEO for the last 10 years of the project. Of course, we've struggled through the years, ups and downs. Uh, we took over in 06. We almost got destroyed completely in the crash of 010 in 08 and then again in 010. Um, we survived the Ebola three years uh, economic drought and we're trying to rebuild, retool, and re-equip the facility. So anyone who would want to go online, you can go to thesoundalodge.com. It's not the most fancy website, but it'll show you who we are and what we do and what we've got. Um, if you would like to help, if you just want to contribute something, you can go through my PayPal and contribute to um, C small C S M A L L one nine two six at AOL dot com C small dot com C S M A L L 
at AOL.com, and you can contribute to PayPal that way. If you're interested in investing, and we do have shares to sell, this we will be going into it in another month and a half or so, you can reach me actually at my telephone number or at that email. Or you can reach me at my telephone number, which is 914-960-2693. And just let me tell you something about the location. We are in Ghana, in the Cape Coast area. Hold on one second, I'm sorry, I'll cover right there. Can you give me, um, can you come out of the shadow? Yeah. Can you, can you, can you, can I, can you mind give me the information one more time so I can just catch you with it? Yes, sir. The whole piece of the No, just the contact information and your emails and all that. Okay. Give me one second. I appreciate you being patient with it. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. To contact me as regards the Sun Alliance Hotel in Ghana, you can reach me by going to my PayPal email, csmall1926 at aol.com. The letter C, S M A L L, 1926 at aol.com. Or you can reach me by telephone, 914 960 2693. If you just want to donate something, go through the C small 1926 at AOL.com. If you would like to talk to us about purchasing shares, which we will be reopening the purchasing of shares in about a month and a half, you can reach me at 914-960-2693. Our corporation in Ghana is called the Sala Lodging Enterprise Limited. Our second corporation is the African American management company Ghana Limited. We own and we manage this complex. Like I said, it's a 30-room villa. It's a walled-in villa. We have our own parking lot, both sides swimming pool, a large conference center, 30 rooms. We have a cocktail bar, pool bar. We even have a pizza piece and a bakery there and a full complement restaurant. We can sit and serve 500 persons at any given time. So it's a fantastic complex. We've been through a lot. We're trying to make a comeback after the Ebola. We do need help. Um, and it's an economic venture. But it's more than that. We, we've already started uh, what we want to do is to do a, um, what do you call it, extended education piece where we can take lectures that's going on in North America and, and have those lectures shown in our conference room there the students right there in Africa. We're only about a 10 minute walk from Cape Coast University, which is one of the largest universities there. We are surrounded by some of the finest high schools in Ghana. And we are right off of the, the ocean one block between the Almina Slave Dungeon, which is the oldest in Africa, and the Cape Coast Slave Dungeon, which is the largest in Africa. So it's a beautiful facility. We want it to be the African-American retreat on the continent of Africa. So step in and do what you can and help us create this. As you can see, at my age, my time, I may live with you alone, but I'm getting old. I can't be running back to Africa, back and forth. We need more young people involved in the project so we can pass the scepter over to you and you can carry this thing forward. And anybody can tell you, about Brother Small, I don't, I'm not into hoarding leadership or trying to be the super dude to the end of time. Every organization I've ever helped to build or ever had, I've passed it over already to younger brothers and sisters. And last but not least, Professor Smalls, you want to talk about anything that you have going on in the near future, whether it be lectures or anything of that nature going on in the near future? Yes, sir. Um, the one thing that's most important to me this year, May 19th, in New York City, at 100, 125th Street and 7th Avenue is the pilgrimage to Malcolm X gravesite on Malcolm X birthday, May 19th. This is our 52nd year of doing the pilgrimage to his grave. We've left at the same time from the same place for 52, 51 years. Um, large contingency come. Last year I think we had 15 buses, 100 plus car. We don't wait for the white man to declare this a holiday for us. We declared it a holiday for ourselves. I've never done anything, never worked on this day. Nobody in my family ever worked or gone to school on this day. In the 45 years I've been married to Sister Carol and we four children. Um, this is our sacred day and our holy day to go and pay respect to a 39-year-old young man 
who gave his life for us and never asked for anything in return. So the least we can do is remember him. I go now as one of the elders, but it is actually handled and facilitated by a group of young brothers called the Sons of Africa, led by a brother named Rick, Reggie Mabry and um, a number of other brothers, you know, Brother Chris and um, Brother Charles and many, many brothers who make up the Sons of Africa. Um, we don't wear uniforms, we don't wear decals, we just show up, do the work, and disappear back into the woodwork. The other thing that I'd like to announce to people every summer, and this summer is no different, I do tours to Africa with the Cultural Heritage African Tours, and we'll be leaving America this year on the 20th of uh, July. We are going to Ghana to celebrate the Panafest Festival and the Emancipation Day Festival. So we'll be stopping in Morocco and spending one day in Morocco, three days in Benin, two, two days in Togo, and the rest of the 15-day period we'll spend in Ghana. So you can again reach me at either the email csmall1926 at al.com or 914-960-2693. It's too late for you to get on the tour I'm going on on the 1st of March, where I'm going for 10 days to celebrate the 60th anniversary with the group of Ghana's Independence. So join us, get involved with us, Cultural Heritage African Tours, Sana Lodging Enterprise Limited, the African American Management Company, Ghana Limited, the OAAU, no, we did not die, we still exist. We do our work in the community and around Africa. And I'm also Vice President of the World African Diaspora Union, who's headed by Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We have a partnership and a working relationship with the African Union to try and represent the interests of the diaspora to the African Union in Addis Ababa. And last but not least, Professor Smalls, on behalf of the Houston Connection, the Shrine of the Black Madonna, MMOA, uh, Blacklist, and Hotep Mag, we would like to present you with a gift, just a token of what we can give to you for all the things that you've done in the community. That's very good, because few people give me gifts for anything. <laughs> my wife and kids, they always give me gifts. <laughs> so y'all are like my kids. <laughs> and you wrap it in red, black, and green. See how you love it? Yeah. All right, all right. Right. So I'm going to tell you a story about the red, black, and green before we end. So it's thank you. some vegan cookies in here. <laughs> oh, thank you, brother. <laughs> you know, on it. Let me tell you a story about the red, black, and green. The red, black, and green, the colors were brought to us by the Honorable Messiah Marcus Gobby. But he never had a red, black, and green flag. He carried a black, red, and green banner. And when Malcolm X was killed in 1965, his sister Ella wanted to wrap his coffin in the flag of Marcus Garvey. And so he went, she went to Brother Michelle, who owned the African bookstore in Harlem, the only black bookstore in Harlem at the time. And he had a flag in his trunk, the, the, the black, red, and green flag that had been eaten up by Mark. And so they took crepe paper and repaired it, and Ella switched the colors from black, red, and green to red, black, and green. Now, the only person that have really written about this is Maulana Karanga. And people said Karanga didn't know what he was talking about. Maulana Karanga is one of the best researchers we've got. And the flag was first flown out of the window of the Teresa Hotel where Malcolm had his headquarters on the, um, as a flag on May 19, 1965. And most of the brothers in the organization quit the OAAU because they said we were going to be charged with treason. The flag would be flown again in 1969 when I raised it over City College campus when we took over 17 buildings to protest us not being students on that campus. And the third time when it came into history when we took over the state office building in the summer of 1969 and we took down the American flag that was flying over Harlem on 125th Street and raised the red, black, and green flag and the City Council of New York tried to charge us with treason, led by a cat named Procaccino. And they came and took the flag down, but they folded it up neatly and came and handed it to us, because <laughs> they knew what it was. And they cut the lines to the flagpole, which was over six story tall. And we got a Native American brother, an Apache, dark-skinned brother named Geronimo, and we bought a can of tar and tarred his body, and he climbed out of six story aluminum pole and he put the flag back up there, and all hell broke was in Harlem, mm -hmm. right? And they came back. It took them three hours to get through the hundreds and hundreds of people who surround the pole that wouldn't let them get to it. 
They had to take a ladder from a fire truck and send a fireman up there and cut it down, and then they brought it fold up again and handed it back to us because they knew what it was and they had all due respect for it. And what they did then is grease the pole with axle grease for a story. But we were bad back then. We were bad back then. Okay. I got I got I got ninety eight percent of that. Okay. Now when you went up to the to the grease with the the grease pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. You need to put another card in there. <laughs> No, because something happened with the pole that I need to tell you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 And then I'll end the thing, because they can't put me in jail now. It's all these years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the statute of limitations on all of that. Uh, so. So I appreciate you rocking with us. Yeah, oh, man. Man. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. I promised little sister I'm going to do this. Yeah. She didn't think I was going to really come through with it. Right? Yeah. Right. You know, they came out after we they cut the line, the cord, and we put the flag back up there. They came out and took a fire. It took them a long time to get a fire engine close enough through all the people, the black people surrounding the pole, to put a ladder up there and take the, the flag down. But they brought it nice and pulled up and handed it to us again, the, the chief of police did this. And so then they greased the pole with axle grease. So all of a sudden, they started getting inundated at the precinct with calls from their homes because somehow somebody had got a list of all the home phone numbers of all the policemen, and they called their wives and said, look, we suggest you call your husband and tell them they need to take that uh, the grease off the pole. When they realized their wives was calling some Negroes, but calling up, <laughs> they came out there with dudes with buckets and soap and started to scrub. And they scrubbed the pole clean. But they put security, four police officers, 24 hours a day for two years to guard that pole, and they finally cut the pole down. 